this list in our number 10 spot, we have Hira C. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out, yeah? I read your comments, okay? And now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning, you're already smart, let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages. Oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united single. Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number 9. Facial Expressions I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen. Quite frankly, I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that, which is fine, to be honest with you. I can, I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen bald look. Imagine that. Imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it'd still get the rankings that it does? Probably not. Probably not. Macy Williams is just... In our number eight spot today, we have Animal Court. The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far, as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like, imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends, though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violent against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. Kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story. Sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times, it really did work for them. Number seven, inns and taverns. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern, not so much housing. More rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment? Well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork 
everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person. So that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll ups all night, looking at you, just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the Middle Ages. You didn't have a fork. No one had forks. If you had a fork, you were luckier, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in ground pool. That was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so. Until the 17th century, you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite-sized amount, and then you ugh, would choke on it, because it's all horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today, we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh, well good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number five, teeth worms. Awesome, you have any cavities? Now you're gonna be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth, worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt. It's an old dirty shirt. We're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed. You had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar, so fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes ban. We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in fining you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine. Some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free, you didn't have to. There was also no time limit. <clears throat> there was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So choose your team wisely, pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time. There's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair. Pause civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. 
Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. While I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy, this led to people of course taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two. If you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union just in case. And finally, number one. Pointed shoes. This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long, huge long nose that went up really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These long toed shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the Krakow, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk? That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day, yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Heretic's Fork. Ah uh, yes, I like sporks. This fork, I don't like. Another horrible thing for your neck right off the bat, here we go. The Heretic's Fork was designed so that nobody has to physically harm the victim, which is one of the worst in my opinion because now it's on them to get hurt from this punishment and then no one has to even be responsible. A double-sided medieval fork, an old rusty, horrible fork, would be attached to your neck with a belt, anything that keeps the fork steady, you name it. So now the victim has to keep their neck straight or else the obvious and horrible would happen. Ugh, I hate it, I have a long neck too. That would be a long commute down. I don't talk about punishments enough on this channel. Some of them, I don't think I'm even allowed to, to be honest. The heretic's fork is no joke. We could thank the Spanish Inquisition for this device, yeah. It was used from 1478 to 1834, most often to get the victim to confess to crimes. There's usually a Latin phrase on these heretic forks. That phrase is abiuro, translating to I recant. If you find a medieval fork in that third drawer down and it says that in Latin, Get out of the house, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, mob football. Ah yes, some medieval footy, let's do it. Growing up, I was lousy with footwork. I couldn't kick a ball for the life of me. Back in the 12th century, I would have been doomed, would have been game over. Back in those days, it was called football because you played this game on your feet. You didn't necessarily have to use your feet to further said ball. And also the goalposts were sometimes miles away, so it made sense to use a throw or two. Also don't stress about picking favorites for your team. Each side consisted of 300 to 500 players, so plenty of room for you and yours. I also forgot the most important rule, of course. Um, you can fight each other. Yeah, you can full on have a brawl, whatever, no rules. It comes to no surprise that there were a few casualties, but finally this game was banned come 1359. King Edward III punished those who played ball by six days of imprisonment. Yeah, it turns out when there's a bubonic plague and you're at war, maybe fighting each other and breaking bones isn't the best way to kill time. You know, maybe go and hit the archery arena. Archery arena? Go shoot some arrows. Go practice. Go, go break some pots. I don't know, whatever Link does in his off time. Number eight. 
don't blow it. This one rings a familiar bell. This is pretty humorous, I'm not gonna lie. We'll lighten it up a bit. Back in the 12th century, horse racing was born in a Suffolk town called the Newmarket. Once King James I got set up in 1606, the sport became more widely known and it was now a major form of entertainment as well. Eventually, laws had to be put in place to protect said prized pupils. Those horses were famous at this point, so if you think you can walk around the streets and, I don't know, blow your nose? Think again, pal, that's illegal. Yes, it was once illegal to blow your nose in the streets because officials didn't want horses getting ill. In fact, if you were outside, sick at all, you had to pay a fine if you were caught. Yeah, imagine you're on your way to the doctors while you're sick, then you get pulled over for a temperature check. You're like, oh, not today, please, oh no. Number seven, forbidden shoes. 15th century shoes, look at these fancy things, come on. Imagine you have to help carry groceries, but you could only use these. When be done. Krakows or pikes, these were the talk of every town. The longer the toe extended, the more wealthy you seemed. I'm talking like six inches sometimes. See Mike's beat? That's huge. Dudes were tripping over their feet sometimes. It was crazy. Most importantly, the common folk were starting to look like royalty. Yeah, how dare you? How dare you look like the English crown, you poser? Finally, a law was passed in 1463. No knight under the rank of a lord, esquire, or gentleman, nor any other person shall wear any shoes or boots having spikes or points which exceed the length of two inches. That lasted until 1604. Yeah, God forbid you're wearing your dad's pikes and then you get busted. Too long, pal. Over two inches, go into the slammer. The punishment for a long pike was a fine of three shillings and four pence. Ah, do I have that? Oh, shoot. That's like 150 bucks today, give or take. Imagine that, all because of your shoes. All because you thought you were rich. Yeah, get a grip, peasant. Go change back in your Berks and socks. Number six, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society. It's honestly one of the worst. Because of the type of psychological distress that it causes, here we go. Basically, this form of punishment involves a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no meaningful contact with anybody else. That's the whole punishment. Now, the isolation that solitary confinement can create can be life altering for people. It's really bad. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long that eventually they just forget about their families entirely. Some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they can no longer speak. Isn't that crazy? Solitary confinement and the negative effects it has on one person is becoming a wider topic of conversation today because of said effects on a person's mental well-being and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Yeah, rightfully so. Can't mess with the brain. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was even worse. It was just a room made of stones. It was pitch black. It was freezing cold. It was also below some horrible, stinky castle. And most of the time, you weren't really alone. No, there were some hairy creatures nibbling away at your toes, but I'll save that for the end. That's pretty, pretty horrible. Number five, medieval tennis. Not to be confused with Mario Tennis, although that's probably just as hard to play, if we're being honest. Medieval Tennis was introduced in 1485, and just like the other insane ball game we covered today, this too was eventually banned. Yeah, that's how you know it's a good one. If you weren't a noble, you couldn't play tennis. You weren't allowed to. You could only play if it was Christmas. Yeah, so you better write that on your wish list. Many believe tennis was disrupting labor and encouraging violence and gambling. Yeah, tennis, encouraging violence. Imagine that. Tennis was eventually referred to as the sport of kings because both King Henry VII and VIII were actually pretty good at it. Yeah, they're like Venus and Serena Williams of medieval times, only not athletic and not nice and also not good at tennis. I mean, why else would you ban the sport, really? Let's be honest. Number four, one meal deal. Okay, so obviously food was a little sparse back in the medieval age. Uber Eats wasn't around yet, but you know what was? Disease, yeah, and, and, hor and worse things, yeah. The life expectancy wasn't great, but even so, laws were still put in place so the common folk wouldn't overindulge. Yeah, hey, I know times are rough, but uh, can you stress eat a little less? Thanks. Yeah, you just look a little gross. Yeah, King Henry VIII needs his ninth bowl of soup, so please stop. They were actually upset that the common folk were matching the lifestyle from higher ups. Nothing to do with supply, really, just appearance. In 1336, a law banned people from eating more than two courses. Soup also counted as one meal, not a sauce. Believe me, they asked. Again, the only exception here at the time, mid 1300s, was Christmas Day. Then you get to eat and have fun and play tennis. Yeah, the one day you can overindulge is the same day you can play tennis. They're like, oh, I can't. Now I can't. Number three, the thumb screw. A little less graphic, but still a horrible specific device used for punishments, dare I say. The thumb screw was used in the Middle Ages to get somebody to spill information or confess to a crime they probably didn't even commit in the first place. We didn't have anything else to detect lies, so these soldiers would make horrible devices to get you to spill the beans or lie and say you did and then 
we can go home. This was one of the best cases, really, the thumb screw. It was also known as the thumbkin, and it would slowly crush your fingers, obviously. Just looking at it, you're like, uh, does it do what I think it does? Yeah, it does. This, of course, turned into the knee crusher, or even worse, the head crusher, which I obviously don't need to explain. Yeah, the classic medieval fork. Now they're getting creative, advancing their gadgets. Nice, we love it. I can't even imagine the knee crusher. That alone, no thank you. Let's move on. Number two, the cake test. Of all the nonsensical tests performed during the Salem witch trials that we covered in part one and two, this one takes the cake. Yeah, pun intended. I did that on purpose. It sounds delicious, but in reality, it was just spreading the disease even more. This was a popular method of seeking out witchcraft in England as well. See, they would make a cake out of, well, you guessed it, rye flour. Remember that, rye flour. And then they would add a little bit of urine from the accused witch. Yeah, I'm more of a chocolate cake guy myself. Not a big fan of urine cake. But hey, who knows? Maybe I'll change. But don't worry, nobody ate this cake, just an unfortunate village dog. Yeah, sad thing. They would feed this cake to a good boy, and then if the dog showed the same witchy symptoms, you know, being sick from said rye, then the town knew for sure that the accused was guilty. I just really wish one villager was like, maybe it's the pee. I'm just saying. Number one, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic to finish off our horrible part three. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their rats and stuff, that's great, but cover their little eyes for this one. This is horrible. Get them out of here. Rats were used as a medieval punishment. Ugh, where do I even start with this one? It was a punishment for the rats too, really. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure or bucket being strapped to his abs or his chest. Inside this enclosure, there are rats which the strapped down person can feel walking around in their skin. And then that's when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other side of the metal enclosure. And historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course, very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. And many of you see where I'm going already and you're like, ooh, yep, it's gonna happen. From here, the rats begin to frantically search for a way out, the softest way out, because just like us, they have survival instincts. And the metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh, that's definitely not. Horrible, huh? Yeah, that's history. At number 10, Groom of the Stool. There were a lot of really horrible jobs back in the Middle Ages. I mean, these people literally took any task you could think of and turned it into an actual profession. From fetching water from the nearest stream to handing drinks to people, everyone had some kind of job. But with that said, some jobs were worse than others, and here's one of them. The Groom of the Stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry a commode around at all times, waiting for the king to do his business, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have to, quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. You know you're well off when you hire someone just to take care of your bodily business. Talk about a crappy job. At number nine, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, one of the biggest threats that people of royal or high status had to worry about was being taken out by their enemies. Monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies as it was one of the most common methods of offing someone. So they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed every morning. They would kiss the pillows, the sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning his clothes too, as well as his sons, and so they would be tested for poison before they got dressed. Henry VIII was really out here providing employment for just about every weird task you could think of. Before we carry on talking about some of the strangest professions from back in the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Leech Collector. Back in the Middle Ages, things were still quite underdeveloped, like medicine for example. In our last video, I told you guys about alchemists who, at the time, were pretty much the ones who sought out cures for different ailments. Because science wasn't really known to them back then, they tried using whatever they could find to create cures, and one of the most common things that were used in medicine were leeches. 
Now, as we've learned by now, anything could become a job in the Middle Ages, and so gathering leeches became a profession. What's even weirder than the fact that finding leeches was someone's job is the method of how they collected those bad boys. Leech collectors would wade into the water with bare legs and wait for the leeches to come to them. They would swish around and try to gather as many leeches on their body as possible. They would then get out of the water and pry the leeches off, putting them into a bucket and selling them to people in town like barber surgeons and other medical professionals. Now I can't say I've ever had a leech on me, so I don't really know what it feels like, but I can imagine that it's an uncomfortable feeling, so to have a bunch of them all over you must have been a nightmare. At number seven, fuller. Wool was a very important part of life for people back in the Middle Ages. They were able to make all sorts of things out of it, and because it was waterproof because of the natural oils in the wool, it made processing the wool quite easy. But soon people found out that whatever they made out of the wool ended up being quite coarse and frayed easily. They figured that if they removed the oil from the wool, then it would make the overall product a little nicer, which it did, but the oil removing process definitely wasn't pleasant. Back then, in order to get the oils off wool, people called fullers would process the wool by pouring stale urine over it and then stomping on it. They needed some kind of alkaline solution to dissolve the oils and urine was the best and most abundant solution. What makes this extra gross though is the fact that when it came to big batches of wool, they would have needed the urine of a bunch of people to get the job done. So that means that the fuller would have been sloshing around in the urine of like half the town. Gross. At number six, ostiary. In the Middle Ages, religion played a big part in the lives of the people, and there were actually quite a few jobs centered around having something to do with the church. This is true with ostiaries, who worked almost like a secretary for the church. This position was normally held by a man who wanted to move up in the church's hierarchy. He was basically doing a menial task to butt kiss his way to the top. Ostiaries were tasked with being kind of like a church bouncer. They would make sure that unbaptized people didn't come into the church during certain times, and they would also man the doors during baptisms. This profession was based on the Roman habit of having a slave guard the doors of their master's house. At number five, bear leader. Now here's a really strange job from the Middle Ages, which sounds both terrifying but also kind of cool. Back in the Middle Ages, blood sports were all the rage. Many of the monarchs who ruled during this time were obsessed with watching blood sports, which honestly kind of explains a lot, but that's besides the point. One of the most popular blood sports was bear baiting, which involved making a pack of dogs fight a bear. Sounds gruesome, but it also begs the question, well, where did you get the bear? Well, that's where bear leaders came into play. For bear leaders, their whole job was to lead bears from village to village so that they could participate in blood sports. Now it sounds super dangerous because, well, we're talking about a big bear, but imagine how much of a flex that would be to say, yeah, I wrangle bears for a living. Like, how cool would that be? Now that's something to put in your Tinder bio. At number four, the piss prophet. As we all know, medicine wasn't all that advanced in the Middle Ages. There were no actual doctors, and the people you would have visited if you were feeling unwell were the same people who doubled as barbers, so I don't know how accurate their medical diagnosis would be. In medieval England, people didn't really know much about health, and many people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. The people who collected people's urine samples were called piss prophets, and they had their own criteria for determining what was going on in someone's body based on their urine. According to the piss prophets, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then it meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were because medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. At number three, muckraker. In our last video about unusual jobs from the Middle Ages, I told you guys about a job where people had to clean up human waste with ladles and then transport it elsewhere to keep the town clean. But there is another profession along those same kind of lines that I'd like to tell you about. Muckrakers were the people who were responsible for cleaning waste off the streets in whatever town they were in. You see, back then, people kind of just disposed of their waste wherever they pleased. But since this waste, like human and animal excrement, rotting food, and entrails had nowhere to go and kind of just sat around the streets, you can just imagine how disgusting that must have been. So that's where muckrakers came in. 
These were brave people who basically rode around town, collecting waste off the ground and throwing it into carts to then be transported out of the city. As horrible as this job may sound though, these people actually made a lot of money. Muckrakers could make in 11 days the same amount as another laborer makes in 6 months. Would you do this job if it made you rich? And number 2, arming squires. I've talked about squires in a previous list about medieval knights, and if you've watched that video, then you might be familiar with how unpleasant the life of a squire could be. At a certain point in their training, a squire would be tasked with basically being an assistant to a knight, and a lot of their assistance was guided towards the knight's armor and weaponry. In the Middle Ages, arming squires were given the task of maintaining the knight's armor. So this meant that they had to make sure that the armor was clean and properly attached to the knight's body. This job was so serious that sometimes the arming squire would have to run out into the battlefield in the middle of a fight to tend to their knight's armor, which meant that they were risking their lives for a couple hunks of metal. And finally, at number one, peer finders. Now I think this last job on our list must be one of the worst ones by far. We've talked about how people harvested leeches, cleaned waste off the streets, and stomped on urine-soaked wool, but imagine if your job was just to go around the town and pick up as much dog poop as you possibly could. This was basically what people called peer finders would do. Dog poop was essentially used as a drying agent by tanneries to make leather for bookbinding. This was a lot of people's full-time jobs, but imagine how crappy this job would have been. Kicking off our list at number 10, stealing. Stealing today, okay, I mean, it depends what you take and most of the time your family doesn't end up abandoning you in the woods, right? I mean, hopefully, right? The Vikings, they didn't play around. Materials were sparse back then. It was hard to replace stolen goods. And the deed of stealing back in the Viking age had severe consequences. The Vikings believed that if you stole, you were a coward. Yeah, and I kind of agree. My bike got stolen twice growing up. Cowards? Both of them. Maybe it was the same guy. I don't know. Stealing was a different kind of low to Vikings, and I'm sure many of you can see eye to eye with this. But when you steal steal from somebody, they don't have a chance to defend themselves, right? There's no honor, there's no battle for land, no fight for property, no bout for glory. It's just a shameless act, right? Raiding and stealing were two very different concepts in the Viking age, because you're probably asking yourself, wait, didn't the Vikings do that horrible stuff where they stole everyone's land? They did, but it was different, apparently. They viewed both differently, although they sound the same in terms of brutality, and someone's losing their home, regardless. A stealer would be abandoned from the clan, pushing them out into the woods for around 20 20 years. Yeah, all because you stole a pine nut. Way to go, Eric the Dumb. Get out of here. Number nine, rodeo. Hold on to your butts for this next one. This one I did not expect, honestly. If you were an early medieval Norseman and somebody insulted your wife, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, the legal punishment afterwards, it can vary. But one of the most bizarre ways to settle your beef, pun intended, was by involving a cow. Yeah, a cow. He came in, he was brought into an area hopefully a controlled area of sorts, and that's where its tail was shaved and then covered in grease. Poor thing, had nothing to do with any of this, and now he's over here. The man's shoes were also heavily greased, and the cow was prodded to make it upset, right? Sounds like something Johnny Knoxville would do for fun, but it was not fun at all. The rodeo began when the man pulled on the cow's tail, like a bell being rung, like, here we go, gong, and then he just got whipped away. Now this, of course, would upset the cow, and it would thrash him about. Now if the man, at this point, can keep hold of the cow's tail, for a specified length of time. Why, he passed the test, of course, and then he was allowed to live on. And he had to keep the cow afterwards. What a weird bonding story, imagine that. Number eight, taking lives. Yeah, what happens when you do the worst of the worst? I mean, today we dish out quite the punishment, you even get a Netflix special or something like that. But back then, somebody in the Viking age? Well, it kind of wasn't a big deal. I know it sounds horrible to say, but hear me out. Back then, as long as the convicted were open and honest about the whole situation, like say, I don't know, if somebody had challenged him to a duel, why then it's fair game. One specific case from history involved a Viking man catching his wife in bed with another Viking. Not good. You don't want to catch your wife in bed with anyone, let alone a Viking. That's game over. His feet are hanging off your bed. You're like, oh, he's so large. No. That Viking man at that point could the fella in bed, but he had to bring that bloody sheet to Viking court. That would have to provide as evidence to show what happened and where and why. You know what I mean? That's simple. Today, there'd be a few more steps involved in that case, obviously. But the Viking age, this case was closed. That's it. They're like, okay, Viking law is done. Go home. 
Someone go raid a village. Number seven, hot-headed. All right, here's the deal. We're doing a list on Viking punishments, so as we go on, yeah, we're gonna get darker and darker with our content. For example, what method of punishment in the later Viking Age also happened to spread alongside Scandinavia's conversion to Christianity? So there are some thoughts and some actions, some questionable thoughts and actions going on in history. And this punishment was referred to as an ordeal by fire. This would involve the accused undergoing some painful exposure to heat. Maybe you drown in flames, maybe you have to eat some sort of fire or flame situation. I don't know. Either way, it was all terrible and it was very, very hot. They would have your hand put into a vat of boiling water or oil or sometimes make you walk across hot coals. And you can only imagine how creative people were getting back then, right? You don't want another rest. Can't even say what happened on YouTube. Use your imagination. Hit that thumbs up and use your imagination. Number six, piece by piece. Okay, what's worse than ordeal by fire? Well, probably amputation. I'd have to go with the latter for sure. That's, it's close. Most definitely. In Viking societies, punishment was often dependent on status. The higher your status, the harder and longer your punishment was. High status folks got some pretty horrible stuff happening to them, honestly. If a thrall carried out a robbery at their master's command, well then it was the master that was punished. So instead of a quick death, they would amputate something. That's horrible. Yeah, continue being a royal, but now your life is going to be much harder. A real life example of such was Nut, the Danish king of England, back from 1016 to 1035. Now the king put in place a horribly grim law that thankfully died with him, but it stipulated back then that a woman committing adultery must lose her nose and ears, while men were merely chastised. Not even close to being fair at all. Now a thrall who had killed their master back then and then tried to run away were to have their arms and legs amputated afterwards. They weren't executed per se, but they could barely survive afterwards. I think I'd rather die at that point. That sounds terrible. Number five, tarring and feathering. Okay, we've all heard about this one. It's brutal, of course, but the most shocking part is how many steps this one involves. You know what I mean? Like you'd think at the feather part, one guy would be plucking like, what are we doing? This is insane. I have to go home. This is, it's been hours here. This is horrible. This one goes goes as far back as 832 AD. This disgusting act has been going down for quite a while. Again, it's so many steps. This is horrible. Who invented this? A man stealing on trade journeys was to be tarred and feathered. This was for stealing during journeys. Again, this is what I'm saying about steps here. First, you'd have to shave this Viking's head, which I don't know if you've seen a Viking recently, but that's gonna take a minute. A lot of hair, sure. Then said Viking was covered in tar and then duck feathers chucked on top. Then as if it couldn't get much worse, this poor guy covered in feathers and tar was forced to run between two lines of the men that he lived with and stole from. Now at that point, these other guys would throw stones, bricks, anything painful, you name it. Now anybody caught not throwing an object at the feathery fellow was liable to be fined. So I know it sucks, but grab something and grab it quick. If the thief did make it through this line alive, again, after being tarred and feathered, then he was off the hook from there on out. Then he was, I guess, innocent? I don't know, that's horrible. I, I wouldn't make that, no way. Number four, trial by ordeal. Quite the ordeal indeed. Look, I mentioned ordeal by fire earlier and that's quite a hot mess, but trial by ordeal is, I have no words. Humans are so stupid, honestly. Introduced after Christianity, wild. Trial by ordeal was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. And yeah, spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it made absolutely zero sense at all. Basically, the accused would be placed into the center of everybody, and then they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. Like, they all just beat this person up. It was horrible, to say the least. If they survived all this pain, they were innocent. And if they didn't, then they were guilty. Who thought, like, who wrote the rule book on this? That doesn't make any sense. What kind of insanity is going on here? But wait, it gets even better. If their wounds were clean and without infection after three days, then they would be found innocent because it was a sign that the gods had intervened to show their innocence. So yeah, a lot of steps to be proven innocent. And healing apparently is one of them. Who knew? Number three, no insults. Yeah, the YouTube comments section could take a, a note from this one. Here we go. No insults. Be nice. This one's pretty good. This would change the game today. If you hurled insults at somebody back in the Viking Age, well, they were entitled to compensation. And they could summon everybody else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, they could be like, hey, you hurt my feelings. Give me $10. I guess that is happening today, but on a much larger scale. Comedians, really. If you spoke bad about somebody during the Viking Age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation, right? And because of that, you need to pay them for the possible damages. Again, we see this happen today in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. It's, it's too late, right? You spoke it, now it's out there. 
you did it. Your reputation was how you gained employment, met friends. It was a really important thing back then, more important than now. Can't be messed with, especially if you're a Viking. Yeah, no way. Also, if you insulted one man, you insulted his entire family as well. You know, the whole Viking rule. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said them to him. So yeah, choose wisely, I guess, with your insults. Number two, rap battles. Before we get to our big bad number one spot on today's list, we have to mention the best part of Viking tradition, in my humble opinion. Battles, but with words, not with our fists, with our emotions. Flighting, or rap battles, or my favorite part of history, I would have killed it, honestly. I was writing some before lunch, and I think I'm okay. During those days, you needed ways to pass time, right? If you couldn't play hockey, and there weren't any villages to destroy, what does a Viking do? Why, you have loud poetry, that's what you do. Flighting comes from the old Norse flyta, meaning provocation. It's basically insult exchange, but make it theater. Now it's just... ASAP Rocky. Norse literature really has tales of their gods flighting. Imagine that. Imagine how cool that would be. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya in some sort of rap circle, some cipher. That'd be amazing. The whole purpose here was not to see who could diss the other's hometown the hardest, but rather this was a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. It's all brains and no brawn. A little different than traditional Viking battles, right? In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast. Imagine that. You'd enjoy a roast while watching a roast in real life. Double the roast, double the fun. Later, this was of course entertainment in the 15th and 16th centuries in Scotland. But don't get it twisted, Viking flighting got pretty intense. And finally, number one, the blood eagle. The best slash worst for last. Here we go. This was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. Again, if you're eating food right now, maybe give it a break for a minute. I don't know, giving you a heads up. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, historically, who both happened to be members of the royal family, they were both in the prone position, right? So they would lie flat on their tummies, then they would have their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create the sort of like, um, what do you, wings, I guess. Just like a nice lungy pair of wings. We love a creative Viking, I guess. Now, both instances where this insane punishment is said to have went down, historically, both of them were accused of killing their own fathers, so. I don't know what was going on back then or who's doing what, but we've got some daddy issues that are not being handled well at all. So don't do that, I guess. Don't do any part of that at any time. Again, how many steps goes into lunging somebody? I can barely carve a pumpkin in one go. You know what I mean? My wrist gets tired. I can't do that. That's a lot of work. Kicking off the list at number 10, the disappearance of the Norse. I just watched The Northman and that was a great time. Highly recommend. Fantastic movie. I'm gonna start barking at dogs, just like he did. That's how I'm gonna do it now. Norse mythology is fascinating, yet of course, mysterious. They settled in Greenland for over 400 years and they left quite the mark, I'd say, or maybe not as much as we'd think. We look at Norse history as violent and bearded and mighty, but Vikings, they were nice, okay? They invented hockey, they skied, women had a large amount of rights compared to what we often see on this channel. And even today in general. But one of life's greatest mysteries are where Greenland's Vikings went. They seemingly disappeared. The only remains are crumbling church walls that were used for barely 500 years. That's nothing. Archaeologists are still unsure what happened to the Norse population. Maybe it was a plague, maybe it was the Inuit, or perhaps they settled back in Europe. It's really hard to tell. Recent excavations provide hints that they settled in the West, most likely relying on trade to survive. So maybe they just followed the goods, but again, Life's greatest mysteries, we have no idea. Number nine, Shroud of Turin. I can't believe it's taken me four parts to mention this, let's go. This legendary cloth is dated back to the late 1200s, early 1300s, you know, that old time. This holy cloth appears to show the image of a man, presumably one J. Christ. It's four meters long and one meter wide, and it sits permanently in the Cathedral of Turin in Northern Italy. So if you're in the area, go take a peek at what many believe to be the burial shroud in which Jesus was wrapped in, you know, after his crucifixion. Sometimes I wake up and I see the outline of my own face in the pillowcase and I think, ah, oh, is that Jesus? Who is this handsome chap right here? Covered in drool. So much drool. Number eight, keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels, although that also takes a great amount of work. Keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. Yeah, this is some high seas punishments. Here we go. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and whatnot. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, and then they'd be lowered to the keel of the ship where, you know, all the ship barnacles and nasty stuff live. And then they would get dragged all around those, plus water pain and drowning. It's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles or the sea, 
Zero chance, I'm not messing with either of those. I'll tell you anything, Blackbeard, literally anything. Number seven, water punishments. Eh, since we're on the topic, let's dive in a bit more. Pun intended. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing that one could possibly go through, let's look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation, it's still around in today. In fact, there's many who pay for it, believe it or not. Yeah, a fun experience today is paying to lay in a dark tub full of salt and water and then floating. It's a magical experience, some would say. It's magical because your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So the dripping machine, the water punishment, anything around that is just all bad, especially in medieval times. Ice cold water dripping on your forehead over and over and over for hours and hours. It's one of the worst and oldest punishments. Everybody's heard about this in some way, shape, or form. In medieval times, they would do it as well. The drops would be at different times too, so you couldn't predict it. You can't see right now, but my toes are wiggling. They're wiggling around in my Berks and socks. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, this big funnel, they would pour nine pints of water um, in your mouth sometimes, yeah. Pain was a form of punishment. This was the normal at one point. I feel sick, I feel so sick. They would do that with wine sometimes too. They'd make people, uh, jesters, chug wine. That was in Game of Thrones one episode. Number six, the breaking wheel. Okay, this one isn't even creative. This is just bad and like just humans at their worst. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, where somebody is tied to it and then everyone else just hammers them over and over. They just beat the out of them. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show, it has to be, some guy's always doing this in medieval times when it's like a guy being punished horribly. He's like, ha ha, it's so stupid. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and then turn, you know, to show everybody what's up, what happens if you steal a loaf of bread, I guess. The other way is they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it. All the while the ropes would get tighter and tighter around your body, yeah. It's kind of like the rack, but with a twist. <sighs> Pun intended. Number five, the Great Fire of London. Back in the 1600s, London saw quite the blaze. The Great Fire of 1666. Now, in the Bible, it references the number 666 as the number of the beast, living, you know, in the depths below and all that good stuff. So many Christians in Europe back in the 1600s believed that the world was going to end in 1666, kind of like our version of the Mayan calendar debacle back in 2012. Well, the thing is, the Great Fire actually did happen that year. Yeah, it happened September 2nd to September 5th. The blaze destroyed the entire city, including 87 churches and 13,000 homes. See, many saw this, of course, as said prophecy to the end of the world coming true, but with all the property damage, the death toll for this great fire was relatively low, as only 10 people died. That's less than half the lives lost in the Salem witch trials, so could be worse. Not great, but surprisingly low for what you would think, looking at this. Number four, Greek fire. More fire facts coming in hot. Puns, a lot of puns today. A blazing mystery, this one is. Okay, Greek fire had scholars and pyromaniacs stumped for decades. This powerful incendiary weapon was used during the seventh century. The Byzantine Empire was on the top of their game with this one. Imagine being the first human to weaponize fire. How terrifying is that? That's horrible. It's been referred to as Roman fire or sticky fire. Many resources suggest that water made this situation worse. The Greek fire was only enhanced with water. That was the magic back then. The trick here was using combustible substances like sulfur, petroleum, all that bad stuff, they would blast it from a safe distance to other ships. The only way to put out Greek fire was copious amounts of sand, vinegar, and urine. Yeah, the third one, no problem. We got lots of that on board. Especially when a Greek fire syringe is facing your ship. Yeah, lots of urine on standby. Just say the word. I'm shaking with fear. Number three, Viking funerals. Now, I know this isn't really messed up, but I really wish we still did these today. This would be a spectacle. Vikings would do funerals in one of two ways. Both were pretty epic to witness back in the day. One, they would bury the body, the classic. They would leave stone circles around the shallow graves that they dug, or they would do burial mounds or grave fields, usually after a large battle. Vikings were pagan, so they believed that the more smoke during a cremation, the better. That was their way of reaching the afterlife. Again, beautiful, ceremonic, 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 that's not a word. Boats also symbolize safe passage to said afterlife in Norse mythology. So Vikings would shape these stones around the grave like a ship, or these mounds would be shaped like a boat of some sorts. How beautiful is that? But high-ranking Norsemen, they would be buried with their boats. In 834 AD, the Osberg ship burial honored two women. This ship vessel was 70 feet long and 17 feet wide. There's 15 oars on each side. It was quite the spectacle. It was discovered in Norway on a farm. So the whole shooting an arrow while they're at sea thing, yeah, it wasn't as common as we believe. Because if you missed, 
you just gave away the Osberg. And you botched a funeral at the same time. Way to go. So more often than not, they would do these ceremonies on land with the arrow and the fire. Which is good news for me, because I have terrible aim. If I was alive back then, I would have missed every time. Number two, not so great flood. This one is most likely how we'll meet our collective demise. I'm gonna call that. Back in the 1500s, German mathematician and astrologer Johann Stoffler predicted that a great flood would cover the world and result, of course, in the death of humanity as we know it. Haha, <laughs> great. He even pinpointed a date. How specific is that? We love warnings. We love heads up here. The date was apparently February 25th, 1524. This was when all the planets would be aligned under Pisces, a water sign, so naturally they thought there would be a large flood. I see the connection, I get it. I'm not totally off board here. Soon after he made said prediction, hundreds of pamphlets were spread around warning of this great flood. And as you can imagine, this caused a lot of panic. A German nobleman believed this, maybe a bit too much, so he gathered all of his resources to build a three-story ark. Yeah, he went full on Noah for this doomsday prediction. The guy had a three-story ark built. The amount of effort in that, come on. In the end though, thankfully, when the day of February 25th, 1524 arrived, it did rain, but it was a light one at most. So there's no flooding going on here. Not yet, at least. And finally, number one, the green-skinned children. This legend comes from the village of Woolpit in Suffolk, England. The story goes that in the 12th century, two children, a brother and a sister, just suddenly appeared in the village out of nowhere. And as their name suggests, they had green skin. Not blue, they weren't avatars. I looked, I checked twice. So obviously my first thought is aliens, for sure. When the children were first found, they were acting kind of sketchy, they seemed nervous, and were seemingly speaking gibberish. To be fair, they were discovered near a wolf pit, so that could explain the nervousness, right? Um, but also, and most importantly, they were green. That's, we're gonna focus on that one today. After they were found, they were taken back to the home of Sir Richard de Cain, where he of course offered them food, water, and shelter, all that good stuff. But they were all set, yeah, and apparently they refused to eat. What's going on here? The only thing they decided to eat over the next few days were green beans that they consumed straight out of the ground. Yeah, raw, there we go. A couple of green beans eating green beans. What a sight. As the children lived with Richard over the following years, he taught them how to speak, and once they had the English tongue down, they told Richard that they're actually inhabitants of the land St. Martin, who is regarded with peculiar veneration in the country which gave us birth. And that they only vaguely remember what happened before they arrived on our planet. So yeah, they're from another planet and not a lot makes sense here. They're with their father hearing the St. Edmund's bell chiming and then all of a sudden they were just teleported to this field in England. So parallel universes, I guess they're real too. Who knew? That's what you get it apart for. Kicking off the list at number 10, together at last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. 
sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks. Can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of ones knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was going to happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches. Just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, 
don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. And no, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too, because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the middle ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed maths in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women. However, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Number 10, starting off strong with animal court. That's right, in the middle ages apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were, of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that, so they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, 
cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding! Number 9. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah? Cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament, which must be observed by God, but not only God, the families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night. Very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family, who would then stay to view the consummation of the union. That's right, the tickly-boo, the boo-boo, the jiggy. Yeah, yeah, that's right, your parents, your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number 8. The Dancing Plague Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the Dancing Plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the Middle Ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Drafia started dancing in the street, and by the end of the week, 40 people joined in, and by the end of the month, 400 people joined in. It was nuts! It was like a massive, never ending rave. Initially, physicians thought folks were just stressed out, so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness, but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point, they were like, oh, we better cut this off, and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray, and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number 7. Men's Fashion I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in, and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you. I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with a whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number 6. Sexy and hairless Women on the other hand had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the middle ages. We have literally almost tried everything and I fear what happens next. Like women's fashion, we just, we've done a lot of stuff. Anyways, in the middle ages a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face. Why? No idea. Maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead, who knows. But either way, it was a big deal. So what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows, hairline, and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. Number 5. Feast of Fools The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy-turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring 
flirting, drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like this is a sin. But despite the ban it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean technically they're already wearing kind of dresses, their long tunics. Number 4 Bloodletting Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip or more usually place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting though is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors. And therefore, relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So, bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got fell sick with a cold, he died that way, it was a lot. Number 3 Here Lies the Heart As you can expect, death was everywhere in the middle ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of 4. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh wow what's happening, their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number 2 The Mystery Plays If you weren't busy trying to avoid the black dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kinda like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title I have to say, football, because football, had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent, they got really, really violent. You could <laughs> you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football, you could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either uh, because soccer still exists today somehow.